also, I think we need to approve the minutes from last week's uh, call. Right, yeah. Um, so yeah, <laughs> again, Chris, you want to you want to motion to approve the minutes? That last second. Second. Perfect. All right. Um, so I think that is uh, done, and and so the uh, as I just sent in an email, um, the vast majority of today's call. Uh, is going to be going over basically the culmination of what we've been talking about so far. It's the, the license types and then the fees um, that we, um, you know, I guess our draft proposal fees to put before the subcommittee um, for feedback. Um, and we put it, as we've talked about a few times, two different fee proposals, one of which uh, meets the statutory requirements of, or uh, estimate uh, could meet the statutory requirements of covering costs, uh, and then the other. Um, which is uh, maybe uh, slightly lower fees to try to increase the amount of folks uh, who can access the market. So, uh, Andrew, if you want to um, start getting ready to, to share that screen, I can kind of start running through like what we've Absolutely. done. So we're just going to operate right off the PowerPoint, I mean, right off of the, um, the, the spreadsheet uh, for this call, if that's all right with everyone. Um, the first thing I just want to say is uh, that while this is a um, – you know, our proposal on fees, it's not the only, um, uh, the only proposal on fees that's coming from the advisory committee overall. Uh, what we haven't done here is take into account for the, um, the, the social equity uh, subgroup and some of the other um, subgroups that are working on issues of fairness and market access. Um, and I know that they are working on uh, reduced fees or, or uh, eliminated fees for certain applicants. Um, so what we tried to do here was um, build a structure out um, that uh, kind of meets the statutory requirements over the covering costs, um, but would also be compatible with um, the recommendations coming from um, coming from that group, because obviously that's uh, an important part of this program and also another statutory requirement um, to, to make sure that there's reduced fees. So uh, don't, as you look at this, I don't want you to say where, where is the social equity um, aspect of it or where is the discount um, that's required by the, by the statute. Um, that will be uh, recommended by a, another subgroup. Uh, and I'm not, I, I think they're talking this afternoon, um, but uh, at some point we'll, we'll try to merge the, merge the two uh, proposals together. Um, but having said that, <laughs> Um, well, I guess having said that, uh, we did try because uh, comments from this group and the public comments that we've received um, have tried to push uh, for low fees generally and, and for a, um, a, a market that prioritizes incorporating smaller growers and smaller businesses. Um, so uh, particularly our fee proposal A is the one that um, we have that slightly higher fees because we know we need to try to hit those, cover those costs. But in our fee proposal B, which we'll get to later, um, we tried to have uh, pretty low costs um, to make a market uh, more accessible to all. So before we get into the actual uh, parts of this uh, proposal, I just want to run through a few things that uh, made this process a little difficult and that um, the subcommittee members should keep in mind as we uh, start evaluating them and um, adjusting them if, if, if need be. Uh, the first is that uh, there's a lot of uh, variables and unknowns in this, uh, in this um, area. Uh, we've tried our best to project a whole bunch of uh, things into the future, but um, if you give me a, I'll just kind of run through some of our assumptions and some of the things that we did to try to uh, address that variability and uncertainty. Um, the first thing being, uh, obviously, don't have uh, a perfect uh, budget summation of what the CCB is going to have for a budget over the next 10 years. Um, but the statutory requirement is to to cover costs for 10 years and pay back deficits. So, um, kind of, we try to create like a little shorthand workaround there, where we took the the budget data that we did have uh, and projected out. Um, a uh, like a three percent cost increase at least for the first uh, couple of years to try to estimate like a, a potential uh, you know median point for for what that budget could look like in out years. Um, 
so that yeah Andrew went over there so you can kind of see where we did that um, and then because we also don't know exactly where the deficit is going to be um, after because obviously as we talked about it, it it's going to cost a lot more money to start up this uh, organization before there's any revenue coming in uh, so there was a the legislature had a fiscal note that said there was 1.8 million dollars that they anticipated being um, a, a deficit as of uh, at, after uh, FY uh, 2024. Um, so that that's the figure that we used. And then for our um, to try to figure out the costs to, to pay back, we spread that deficit out over um, over those next seven years. Um, for, for payback purposes, uh, if, if that makes sense. So the two figures you see there is basically the cost that we think we would need to hit to cover costs uh, for fees, and then the cost that we think we would need to hit um, in order to both cover costs and pay back that initial outlay of funds to the to the Cannabis Control Commission, uh, or Cannabis Control Board. Um, so that is, um, that's kind of our, our baseline. Uh, again, it, there's a lot of guesswork there. Um, and, and I imagine that that's not gonna be the exact dollar amount that the budget will be, but we thought it gave uh, an estimate to aim for. Um, and so that's kind of what we're using. And then also, as you see, it, grow, it goes up, but to, to simplify the math, um, we basically have aimed to have, to meet those figures in FY25 um, for, for a couple of reasons. The first one being that in the early years, you're going to have a lot of um, businesses entering the market, so it's hard to tell which year they'll actually be in. But by uh, FY25, hopefully a good chunk of those uh, businesses uh, interested in joining the uh, adult use cannabis market in Vermont um, will be up and paying uh, annual license fees. Uh, and the second thing is that, as we've talked about in previous calls there are other uh, other license types that we may want to look at in the future like delivery co-ops things along those lines uh, that could uh, provide additional revenue in the out years so uh, for the purposes of this I think what our goal was was to to aim that by 20 uh, 2025 fee revenue would be equal to cost or uh, equal to cost plus uh, payback of the um, deficit so uh, that was a long-winded um, explanation of the target that we're aiming for. Um, the other major variable uh, is that there are, it's hard to tell exactly how many, uh, what the demand for opening up a business in Vermont is going to be. This is something that we've talked about a lot uh, before as well. So how we tried to get around that was to, um, we created three different dynamics uh, based on how many businesses we thought might might be enter might want to enter um, dynamic one and you can see them in these columns the first column is dynamic one this is a market that would have very robust interest in starting uh, cannabis businesses in Vermont um, if this is the sort of uh, interest that we have um, then uh, we will be certainly fine hitting all of our fee uh, and canopy requirements um, so this is probably a very aggressive amount of um, interest. The middle uh, dynamic is probably a more reasonable one uh, based on our estimates. Um, so that, that's been the one that we wanted to make sure hit the, um, hit the feed limits as best. Because I, I think that's probably, if we had to project, would be closest to what we think the projection would probably be. Uh, and then the final one is basically the, uh, the um, not doomsday scenario, but the uh, not great scenario of there's not a lot of interest for, for various reasons. Um, so this is kind of where it would end up. And in, in, in a situation like that, um, the board would probably be looking at figuring out ways to get more people into the market, um, either through lower license fees or uh, other incentives or, or, or things like that. So um, that is uh, quite a bit of uh, rundown on, on um, background of how we built this model and how we tried to take out some of, or address the ambiguity. Um, so I hope, uh, I hope that makes sense to everyone. Are there any questions on that before we start going into um, what we did here? And I think first, because we never finished the, uh, the, the license type discussion, I'll start by just going through the license types um, and then we'll go into the fees. But I'll let's stop for questions because that was probably a lot and I, um, probably need to catch my breath. Uh, 
All right. Um, hearing none, uh, we will go into the fees. I mean, into the license type. So, um, Andrew, if you want to just scroll up to the to the top, um, you'll see that on the left-hand column here is where we put all of the um, the, the different license types uh, that we think could be offered. Uh, or, I mean, there's obviously other options, but this is what we would. This is our like draft proposal as of now. Um, the goal here, uh, and Andrew and Jen, feel free to jump in if you had uh, if you want to add anything. But uh, the goal here was to try to create a market that was um, heavy on smaller cultivators um, and try to create a market that allowed for more opportunities rather than a couple of. Um, large uh, companies uh, entering and, and dominating the market. So um, we had both a tiering for outdoor cultivation and indoor cultivation. Um, we started, uh, I guess, starting at outdoor, we, we envisioned three immediate tiers and uh, a fourth uh, tier that would be delayed a little bit. So um, tier one would be that under a thousand square foot uh, cultivation tier, that's kind of the small cultivator from the um, uh, from the statute. And then we had a under 3,000 and an under 6,000. Uh, we also put in this uh, under 10,000 uh, square foot, but in brackets there you can see it says delayed. Um, we were thinking, and this and for, for indoor, um, that we would uh, propose starting with small cultivation tiers uh, to begin with overall, um, but provide the board uh, opportunities to in the future uh, expand uh, to larger tiers. Um, that could be for a couple of reasons. First one being one of the small tiers, one of the guys in the small tiers doing a great job developing um, a brand and needs to, needs to expand so that they should have the opportunity to grow as their business grows. Uh, and the second one being a safety valve if um, if the market for the small licenses doesn't develop the way that um, we hope and, and some people think, that provides a, a, an opportunity to um, provide some larger cultivators uh, if needed to, um, to, to meet the, the demand of the market. So, um, so that, that's the, those are the tiers for, for outdoor. Uh, maybe I'll stop after each one and just pause for questions. So outdoor cultivation tiers, those four tiers, does that, does that make sense? Any thoughts? And again, we'll just go through the license types first and then we'll go back through the fees. Um, this is Stephanie. I wanted to compare the fee proposal and I have to look at statute as compared to the hemp proposal because it may be cheaper to grow 3,000 square feet of cannabis than it is to grow so let me just compare. I'll get back to you. I'm gonna look. Yeah, that that sounds good. Yeah, I did not. Um, uh, and again, we yeah, have like a, those fees are the annual renewal uh, license fees and annual renewal fees. There'd also be um, application fees as well, um, like one-time application fees. But that the numbers that you see in that column are the are the uh, the uh, the annual fees. So we try to keep them low, but we'll make sure that we try to align it with the hemp fees if uh, or or not create. Uh, uh, weird dichotomies in in-state statute and state fees. So um, check on that and let us know. And then for uh, indoor cultivation, same concept, only uh, more tiers uh, and going uh, higher up in, in total cultivation. Um, in that, it, um, the tier four, uh, the 10,000, um, the 10,000 square foot would be available uh, right off the right off the bat, um, and then uh, in this model, and this is where some spot where we differ between B proposal A and B proposal B is that uh, as we're starting to try to figure out how we make the numbers work for um, uh, to to meet the budget, it looks like we might need to add in this higher fee, higher tier. Um, in in proposal A to hit the hit the budget numbers, so we would allow up to a 25,000 square foot facility in the first round. Um, in some of the other in proposal B, um, we actually have that uh, tier delayed. Um, but um, for proposal A, we thought it, when we were trying to make the the 
uh, revenue numbers and estimates uh, accurate, I, I think we might need to have that larger um, tier imme available immediately. So, and then also we wanted to have that larger scale 50,000 square foot facility again available for the board if needed um, or if any of these uh, companies grow and exceed. Uh, we want to try to build in as much um, flexibility for future growth as possible, but that would be something that wouldn't be eligible for people to apply for um, uh, off the bat, wouldn't be available uh, day one from, from the market. So um, I'll pause there again to, to talk about that um, for, for the actual, I guess, do you have any questions about the tiering structure? Do those tiers seem to make um, sense to everyone? Do they have any questions about whether there needs to be uh, higher or lower tiers. You'll notice that we've talked about before creating like tiers below that thousand square foot. Um, again, we thought that that probably wasn't necessary because um, we we're trying to keep the fees low for a thousand and under. And it's it's not there's not a minimum requirement. So if you get that license, you you don't have to grow a thousand square feet. Like you can you can build your business however you want, um, but our goal is to not try to create too many small licenses, but to try to keep all of those small licenses um, more affordable. Um, but again, open to open to comments on that. Thanks, Dan. I, I also wanted to jump in and just mention that, you know, in this case, and I, I think it probably makes the most sense from a uh, producer flexibility standpoint, to have the cultivation square footage be on total cannabis grown, uh, which includes veg space and flowering space. Um, so a good way to think about it is the flowering canopy is gonna probably, it depends on indoor, outdoor type of growth and things like that, probably about 50 per square, fifty percent of the uh, cultivation square feet area. Um, and that also accounts for, you know, not necessarily hallways and rooms, but portions of rooms that, you know, you're not, you're not going to wall to wall with plants. Um, and so with this sort of thing, you know, we end up with a total amount of about a little over 900,000 square feet. And this is a, we could probably bump this down a little bit. This is the upper edge of, you know, what I'm thinking might be needed as far as flowering canopy square foot. Um, I, I, I'll let the other subcommittee know that I, I did set a new revised version of the pro forma model uh, of the market analysis model back to the uh, CCB yesterday, um, given some, some potential changes uh, based on interpretation of, of product selection, uh, may actually increase the total square footage needed, probably somewhere uh, closer in that 400 to 450 range than in the 300 to 400 range. And just one more note about, about that, um, just a, a, a thing that we haven't added to this model yet, that cultivation figure that changes as you adjust these uh, number of licenses and things along those lines in this model does not account for the existing um, uh, or the existing businesses or, or wow, what will be the integrated licenses. We just haven't added that uh, dynamic to the to the model yet. So as you're looking at it, you should always be like add 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 some square footage, add some capacity there because it's just um, um, uh, it will be underestimated slightly because of that that factor. And uh, James and, and others, I, I, I know we've corresponded back and forth, and I, I've been corresponding with, with Lindsay Wells uh, as well. Uh, but if it's possible to obtain exact information on the amount of cannabis cultivated by the existing operators or square footage, I, I obtained some of it directly from the cultivators, but not enough that I could provide it at the full state level, since uh, there's a limited number of cultivators that I didn't want to provide any potentially identifying information. Um, but that is going to be paramount to, to truly understanding um, what the market may look like uh, at transition and, and over those initial growth periods. Um, thanks, Andrew. Any any thoughts? Uh, any other thoughts on the um, cultivation tiering before we um, bounce to, to retail licenses? Um, this is Stephanie. Uh, it's fine with the hemp. Um, indoor cultivation the over 500 square feet is two thousand dollars so it seems to be aligned with the smallest size of indoor cannabis mm -hmm. cultivation so it seems fine um, the other thing I wanted to ask is um, 
the or uh, bring up is is that I I understand that um, cannabis products may include some portion of, of hemp, you know, CBD, I guess, um, in the formulation of those products that are sold to the market, and whether or not these licenses or is there potential for licenses to include canopy that is grown that for CBD but might not um, but might meet the definition of hemp um, or just yeah, because yeah. I think that there's a there's a fair bit of um, I mean I, th I think under the the USDA domestic hemp um, production program it'll be difficult for a cannabis cultivator to also grow hemp in the same location maybe on a different property it would be okay only because inspectors in the hemp program have to have full access to all cannabis plants growing and or in storage um, for the purposes of sampling and I think that in, in itself will limit the ability for those uh, cultiv for cultivating both of those the same plant, yet two different plants in the same location. Yeah, I, I mean, I, um, I, I was envisioning that being not done in the same cultivation facility uh, for the reasons you mentioned, and just because for um, you know generally uh, the uh, cost of, of operating these facilities would um, normally lead to trying to reduce the. The higher value uh, product um, inside of them, but um, like I, I was thinking that we would in the the regulation just allow for uh, it kind of as a an input ingredient so that products from the hemp lane could enter at various points into the um, into the the marijuana lane, um, I guess. But uh, I don't know, Andrew, if you have any thoughts on that, or Jen, um, do you, do you think we would need to try to create some sort of like um, uh, well, variable cultivation canopy limit. Uh, like I, I, I would think that they, if a company wanted to do both, they would probably have separate facilities. That probably at least not. Have divided property. Yeah. 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 No, I, that's entirely possible. Um, I was just thinking of a streamlined, because it is the same plant. Um, mm -hmm. And if at some point in the future it becomes legal nationally, then we're setting up a system of two different but you know we have time um i guess <laughs> to address that in the future um i was just thinking outside the box for a streamlined process and less confusion and potentially even less money but for growers generally but that's okay <laughs> no yeah no i, I mean I, I like uh thinking outside the box and i, I wonder if there's a, a way that we could I mean, you could obviously grow because it's the same plant. You could grow hemp under these cultivation limits, but do so you think like you would want to be able to like? I don't know. It, actually, a lot of it's probably going to depend on the exact definition of, of how we define this canopy. I would think, um, but I don't want to. Um, I'm kind of thinking, as you can tell from my pauses, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking through it aloud. I'm not exactly sure um, how we would approach it, but. That's a good point, and we can, and uh, maybe we'll think more about it um, going forward, and see if there's a way that we can try to make, basically build in, uh, uh, anti anticipate future changes to the at the federal level, so that the Vermont process can as quickly as possible streamline to kind of the new new reality uh, pending federal legalization. But um, I will try to we'll try to think about that going forward. And Dan, Chris Walsh here. Um, I mean, this is really only applicable to the outdoor cultivation licenses. You know, you're really, you're probably not going to get people using kilowatts to be growing hemp indoors. Yeah, that that makes um, that that makes a lot of sense. So maybe we maybe for the outdoor cultivation, we just have a separate because you might be able to. That's that's an easier problem to solve if we have to. You can just say that you're. You know your cultivation for uh, for uh, adult use uh, cannabis doesn't your square footage is only that for, or you can co-locate with a hemp facility and those your square footage for both both programs uh, don't count against each other or something along those lines. That's right. Um, if we yeah. Um, so that's good. Any other question just on the um, basically the scale of, of the uh, 
the tiers. Like these are obviously much lower tiers than you see in in a lot of other states. Um, but we thought that that uh, was one way to encourage more uh, more businesses to enter, and also uh, like more small businesses to enter, and also just the market here is going to be smaller than the other states. So there's there's not a need for uh, you know a bunch of hundred thousand square foot facilities. So um, we think this should work. Um, but again, it's a lot of one of the things that I think is important uh, that we have included, um, thanks to your the guidance from the board here, is that that what we've called either uh, vary between calling it a provisional license or like an intent to apply. Basically, early on, provide some sort of so here it's called a provisional license, but it's it's probably more of like an intent to apply. It's basically a way for the board to um, get an early estimate of interest in cultivation. Um, and if you if we don't see the um, if we don't see the interest uh, that we would want to see, um, you may want to kind of reevaluate uh, like how we're how we're going and probably see if there are if there's a market for some larger facilities in order to um, to, to maintain to make sure that we hit demand. Um, but so we thought that. That's kind of our, our two point uh, flexibility here was we wanted to build in uh, other higher license sites that aren't authorized from the start as we've already talked about and then have that provisional process so that you can get a real quick gauge of like, oh, there's a bunch of people who are interested in opening up, you know, uh, indoor facilities of 5,000 square feet or less. You, you might be all right for, for your demand. If uh, only a few of those trickle in, um, you may, you probably want to reevaluate uh, how you envision the market and, and try to um, see if we can entice some some uh, other folks to enter the market, whether those are little guys or big guys, just anyone who can um, service the demand. So um, that's kind of the, the rundown for for cultivation. Um, I'll move on to uh, retail, which we already talked about a couple of days ago. Um, uh, if, if there aren't any other questions, and then we'll go, jump back up to fees. All right, for retail, it's pretty simple. Um, we uh, had retail storefront, which is uh, what everyone, as we've talked about before, that's the the uh, retail store that uh, that everyone's thinking of that sells adult use products to, to folks um, who have been ID'd entering and the sales go into the to the sales tracking system. The seed and clones, um, we also talked about this, I think it was a week ago today. Um, that would be a, um, selling seeds and clones, uh, that would be a, a, not a, um, not selling finished products, not selling um, uh, any sort of like adult use finished products or, or flour directly to, to consumers. Um, those are the only two license types that we factored into this, um, into this spreadsheet, uh, because as we talked about on the last, again, a week ago, there was two other license types that we think uh, could be viable for this market and could be a real, a real help to increase um, access to products, but they'll de depend on the, the other security requirements, uh, input from other subcommittees, things along those lines, and we're, we're happy to keep trying to work these out, but didn't want to like factor them in yet. One is that limited retail uh, facility, which would be uh, part of an existing uh, business. Uh, you know, the, the model here is to give a boost to the general store by letting them kind of secure one area of the store and sell a limited number of uh, adult use cannabis products. Um, as we talked about, there's some quite a few uh, things left to, to figure out exactly how that would work, but we think it could be a really good model for uh, Vermont's both culture and demographics. Um, it would be, there's a lot of towns in Vermont that probably can't support a full storefront, um, but could probably support, uh, it, you know, a, a a, a limited uh, sales coming from from one of their existing stores, uh, and then the second one is the the retail uh, the farmer retail, which would allow farmers to sell a limited number of products directly to consumers, whether from their farm, um, like from their outdoor cultivation facility or from um, you know farmers markets or the like. But again, a lot of security requirements and things um, to to, uh, to to work out. So we didn't factor them into having licenses in this round to, to be safe for projecting costs, um, but I do think they're both viable and, and valuable 
license types going forward. So probably in this subcommittee and probably with other subcommittees, we should further explore how that would look and, and how to how to go. But um, I included them here for fee setting purposes, but not for um, uh, for factoring into the to the overall cost. Um, the other two type license types are ones that are future contemplated, and I didn't include in the spreadsheet, but um, it seems like we need more discussion about uh, delivery and kind of like event and on, on-site consumption purposes. So um, we have a tab for potential future license types there and there. They're just kind of, I guess, in, in the holding pattern uh, for now while we figure out, um, you know, how, how to go forward with those, but kind of stuck to the to the core license types for um, for the job of project, projecting fee revenue. So. Um, does that make sense, everyone? That's kind of, I think, what we talked about on the call the other day. Dan, Chris Walsh, uh, just trying to get clarity. Um, why are we having the seed and clone license be exclusively or mutually exclusive with the regular retail instead of giving retail the option to bolt on that secondary license? Um, what's the logic of keeping fine finished flower separate from clones and seeds? Um, I don't actually think we've uh, decided whether or not, uh, like, I don't think we've actually talked about it, so I'm glad you brought up a good point here. Um, again, with all of these license types, they haven't fully been defined in statute yet, uh, or I mean, they're not defined in statute, uh, they're, and they haven't been defined in the regulations yet, so uh, it's kind of up to the board on how they would like to, which kind of what activities a retail license um, could have so you could have a retail you could we could allow retail facilities to do both um, I, I, I recommend that, I recommend that because I don't think and I and I know these metrics pretty well I just do not think with the limitations that home growers have that there's a that much money generated I mean all you could really sell per customer is seven clones and seeds are very expensive. I just can't see a standalone brick and mortar sustaining any sort of success just selling seeds and clones. But if it was a secondary, you know, upsell, if people are coming into a dispensary for finished product, um, you know, like you see in other states, and I think there's there's a reason why they they combine it like that. Yeah. So to, to kind of elaborate on some of this. I think when, when Dan and I and Chen and others were, were, were thinking about this, a normal retail storefront would be able to sell seeds and clones. So the normal retail storefront license would be all inclusive of products and flour and seeds and clones. And the seeds and clones license would be a smaller license that probably would be either, either utilized by um, a, say, a garden store wanted to sell yeah, seeds or, and clones. or a grow store yeah. or yep. or a grow store or maybe um, you know a locality wants to allow um, cultivators to sell seeds and clones but maybe not full bud um, and so they're able to sell seeds and clones um, from you know a from their premises because of uh, you know the lower security costs associated with, with you know not selling dried flour um, so we kind of had a vision the seeds and clones that would, I agree, would, would not be able to sustain a, a standalone brick and mortar store. It would probably be added on to either existing, you know, floral shop, uh, you know, garden centers, existing grow centers, uh, and maybe uh, cultivators if, if that is permitted. The other thing we need to consider is um, until we figure out like this nursery license, you know, there are going to be cultivators, especially year one. That want to hit the ground running so if you're just a regular you know over 21 year old that wants to buy seven clones and grow them in your basement or or in your backyard uh we should have some sort of way to distinguish uh, a license holder because theoretically i think you could have people that are going to want to buy a thousand clones per purchase uh, are, are you talking about other like uh cultivation licensees no i'm i'm, I'm I'm trying to sort of figure out a way where, you know, the, the the seed and clone license makes a lot of sense, but you have two different customers for clones. You have someone who's just 21 years old 
who comes into a store and he wants to buy seven clones to grow in his backyard or in a tent or something, but you, you know, and, and this goes to that nursery license, which to me isn't really defined yet. You know, you may have somebody want to call the store and make an arrangement to buy an entire flat of clones because they have a tier one license and they want to grow a hundred plants. So, yeah. So typically that is done from the cultivation to cultivation. So, you know, I don't know whether or not there needs to be some statutory change to allow this and kind of what the dynamics are, but ordinarily in other states, essentially a, a cultivator could not go to a retail store, like let's say in Colorado, a cultivation facility owner could not go to a retail store, buy clones from retail, and then use those to populate their inventory. They would have to go directly, essentially, from the, a cultivation facility and do an inventory to inventory transfer but in that I regard. Think, so I, I mean, I, I actually think Chris, uh, I think that makes sense, Andrew, but I think Chris brings up a, a good point, and I think it's one that we can fix in, in uh, through through the regs, though, because I, I, think, I think he's looking at you know, even for somebody with that smallest outdoor license, um, you know, maybe we do let them go to these seed, uh, seed and clone stores, um, but there needs to be a way to differentiate between somebody who's actually already licensed to, to possess enough, like to, to grow a full thousand square feet outdoors versus the, the uh, um, you know, just your normal home grower. Well, um, but I think we can do that. I think we can do that through, through, um, through the regulations later. Uh, you probably just have, you create like a, a purchase limit for the seed and clone stores where basically like if you are a registered if you're a registered uh, employee of a of a licensee or like if the sale is to a, another licensed business you have a higher purchase limit than if you're just a um a well if uh, just to kind of follow up um if we don't figure out this nursery license for year one, then when you say you can buy cultivator cultivator it's kind of like a chicken or the egg like year one no one's going to be up and running before anybody else except for the vertically integrated. And even if they could sell more than seven clones to a license holder, they're never going to be able to fulfill the demand. So you have, you know, a couple hundred licenses, everybody's dumping money into their infrastructure and they want to hit the ground running. They don't want to like pop seeds on day one. They want to like get plants growing. So, you know, there's going to be a huge demand for startup, uh, plants and i i just you know i'm thinking throughout this whole process like where is this all going to come from unless people are growing illegally you know i mean you're you've got a five thousand foot facility um your license doesn't kick in for two months you're building everything where are you creating your 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 actual plants where are they coming from because no one's going to want to pop seeds Yeah, um, I'm going to look up the law for a second because I'm pretty sure there is a potential allotment in there for uh, uh, the small cultivator dynamic as far as obtaining cannabis. Um, but what I will tell you is that while this is a conceptual problem in every single state in the country, it is not actually a market implementation problem. To try to read between the lines there. Yeah, I'm reading between the lines. Yeah, uh, it normally, uh, you know, normally ends up working its, itself out without uh, too many questions uh, being asked. Um, but the, uh, I, I think, but Chris, I think you actually bring up a good point in that we could try to bring a good chunk of this uh, or some of this uh, above above the board um, through if we do a good job of setting up the, the seed uh, a seed and, sorry seed, seed and clone uh, licenses early um, and figure out how to like structure their sales um, to other um, uh, other like nursery licenses or other outdoor cultivators uh, early in the process so um, I think I think that's something that uh, we should work on and that the, the board should look at trying to figure out exactly how to um, design that so that 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 license can serve both kind of your uh, your hobby grower um, and also some of your small outdoor cultivators um, who, who will be looking for 
uh, for clones as they start up. So and, and I, I also, think that's a that's great. To, I I agree with that. Just to add one last thing, um, I would also highly recommend that that license type is you know, in the cadence of licenses, that, that goes out early, similar to the laboratory, so you don't get bottlenecked. Like that, that should be a, that, that license should come out before some of the other licenses. Um, I think lab, lab licenses is number one, so you don't bottleneck the program, but large scale clone sales should be right behind that, whether that's nursery or seed and clone. <laughs> yeah, that, well, that, that being said, yeah. We have not seen large cell, large scale seen in clone businesses as a standalone cultivation be prevalent in all that many states. Um, and I think that is because of some of the dynamics that occurs, both the profitability of the cultivation licenses, uh, as well as um, some of the issues we discussed, you know, right previously. Um, there are some states that allow existing uh, medical cannabis uh, patients to transition over, you know, cl uh, clones for a set amount of time as a period. If you are really concerned about that, that may require statutory change rather than just regulatory. But there are examples of other states making this work um, for that kind of intervening period that is a little complicated. Um. So I took notes uh, to, that we should work on that, and uh, Chris, I agree with um, the the timing and and the concept here. So uh, we should we should add that to um, future conversations, and 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 remember to remember when we're drafting uh, the regulations. I just want to move on for the sake of time um, to just at least run through these license types. And again, most of Monday's call is also going to be reserved to kind of go over this because I figured we'd run. This is kind of the the meat and potatoes of what we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. So um, figured we'd reserve more time to, to keep the conversation going. But um, the next one uh, was the manufacturing licenses, which I guess uh, similar to the retail and season clones is basically uh, two licenses. One, tier one allows you to do everything. Tier two is limited. So you basically are allowed to um, so it's not that you wouldn't have to get both if you wanted to uh, to, to do everything. It was you. It's just that tier two is basically, um, you know, doesn't allow the uh, solvent-based extraction or the CO2 extraction. So that you're able to um, basically make infused products, but not um, uh, not have the full manufacturing uh, capabilities that others do. Um, and then the last three license types just to get them on the board because I think this is where we ran out of time but we could go to is um, the integrated license which we I think everyone knows about which is the existing uh, businesses um, and the wholesale license um, which we which could be an interesting license type but uh, in the statute it looks like most of the other businesses can wholesale as as well so um, there probably won't be a, a ton of demand uh, for that um just because it, most most companies will want to just do uh um but but there will be some demand and then testing laboratories which uh chris already highlighted what that those could be a an issue that we probably need to work through further because we would need to make sure that we have uh, enough testing capability to not create bottlenecks at the beginning so um for our purposes here i think the only reason to talk about it is just that we wanted to keep testing uh like fees and application stuff low because um, we would want to scare off any potential testing labs from from the state because um, we would obviously want to bring in as much testing capacity as, as we can. So um, those are the rest of the license types. Uh, any questions on that or anything that you think we're uh, missing? Stephanie, I see your hands raised. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that the um, hemp program has a um, lab certification program and the cost to become a certified lab annually is fifteen hundred dollars um so i just wanted to clarify whether and that is a cannabis quality control program which includes um, we have set standards for contaminants in cannabis in addition to hemp um, and i just wanted to make sure i understood that this would be a cost over and above a certified lab or is it that we currently manage at the agency I and mean, this might be an open question as well um, yeah, this yeah. might be one that 
we wanted to, um, we should probably coordinate uh, on that fee. I would, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know a ton about, like it seems like if those labs are, are, uh, are qualified and, and uh, approved to, to do this, I don't think that they would, I, I, I wouldn't think that they, I, I guess it's up to the board and up to others. Uh, I, I wouldn't really want to just keep hitting more fees on, on testing labs. I think we want testing labs. Um, yeah. So if we all feel comfortable that the uh, the accreditation needed for uh, the hemp program would be fine for testing uh, adult use of medical cannabis, I think um, we could align the fees properly so that they uh, aren't paying double fees. Does that make sense to everyone? Yep. Yeah, I mean, it definitely makes sense to me. So Stephanie, just a quick question. What do you think the hemp testing labs that exist in the state first, do you know how many there are? So. We currently have two labs that are certified to do testing in the state. Okay. One for, well, three actually, um, two for potency and one for metals and other contaminants. Um, and we suspect we'll probably get at least two more applications in for lab certification within the state of Vermont and potentially, and potentially more. Um, yeah. We have at least eight labs that were interested in participating in an interlaboratory um, survey or, or study for their practices. Uh, so it could be up to eight. <laughs> I mean, given, so I, I, I've done quite a bit of research on uh, lab testing and lab markets and stuff like that. I wrote a big paper for NCIA a few years ago. Um, I do have serious concerns about whether or not Vermont's market is large enough to sustain a healthy a lab testing market itself. Right, like you need a certain number of, of uh, amount of throughput to sustain a lab, and you need enough labs to, to be competitive. So I, as much as possible, would love to see the labs that exist in the state and any new labs be able to service both the hemp and uh, marijuana industry. And so um, I, I don't know what hesitancy those existing testing labs may have to work on both, given. As federal law progresses, it may be additional scrutiny on hemp testing laboratories. Um, but kind of just one of your thoughts there, Stephanie, you know, it, it may require to a certain extent for the health of the market for, for those labs to be able to open their arms to all types of cannabis to see about regardless of its THC content. I do believe that's possible that some of the existing or at least one of the existing labs may be interested in, in that that we have certified um, I mean they will have to be DEA registered as well yeah um, complicated. under federal law um, but but my understanding is that in the state of Oregon that the um, the health department there certifies labs or accredits labs um, and those labs both test hemp and cannabis in that state um, so I don't know that the I mean, there's still potential a problem with DEA registration, but um, I, I think my understanding is DEA is willing to work <laughs> with those labs and with these industries, um, understanding the same plan. Hey, this is Chris Walsh. I just wanted to add to um, seeing this in other states, and I actually talked to Tom, the owner of Bia Diagnostics, but, you know, part of the hesitation about, you know, too many labs, not enough business is, you know, we really need to change the the philosophy where we should make it available to everybody, including home growers. I mean, I think is yeah. the multi-panel tests kick in because right now with the, the medical license holders, you're only testing for cannabinoids. Once you start testing for yeast, mold, solvents, heavy metals, um, I think that's gonna rub off on uh, even home growers and, um, people want to know what they're inhaling so like if we can have nurseries take samples as like a kiosk for labs or grocery stores um, I mean I've seen this in Rhode Island and a couple other states on the East Coast and it, it, it definitely adds tremendous amount of business I mean the market for home growers is is get potentially huge in Vermont Absolutely. Yeah. That, I think that, that's a good point yeah yeah definitely yeah. a good point I, yeah. one of the recommendations you would I have one other I question. Think our, uh, oh, sorry, Chris. You can sorry, go. I'm just jumping all over the place because I have ADD. Um, 
on the manufacturing licenses. I just want to get clarity, um, not to sound like I'm getting caught up in semantics, but if I was a tier two manufacturer, I could still make bubble hash and rosin, correct? Because those are solventless. Uh, I mean, I personally think so. This is all up to regs, but I was thinking that the tier one would just be for essentially a higher risk. Right. Yeah, you're not going to blow yourself so, up making uh, yeah. bubble hash. And so, so typically with this, is, you know, there's another question too, and this differs state to state of whether or not even making bubble hash is something that a cultivation license can do as part of processing similar to rolling joints. I think that is, is probably more of a reason to push that into, you know, a tier, tier one or tier two manufacturing license. But normally, you know, I, I was looking at this in a similar way that I think, you know, California does, which is granted for other states that allow for um, hydrocarbon based extraction, yep. they also put that in that tier one. But given that CO2 requires such high pressures, yep. that it is still dangerous. And yep. so you're, you're really dealing with, with the difference there. Whereas a tier two could make like topical lotions in which they're just using an alcohol, like alcohol without pressure. Or I've seen people do it where they're just using a crock pot, not the same level of danger as uh, a CO2. So especially. tier tier two would be you you know manufacturing without the safe room. Yeah, yeah, you probably yeah. would not need the same degree. Yeah. I mean, you need a fire inspection anyway, right. but you probably wouldn't need a certified engineer or things like that. Uh, I, this is all to be determined in regulation, uh, where it gets I, a little more nitty gritty. But I think we're on the same page. As yeah, but I think that was where we envisioned that line was basically like the 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 more danger uh, extraction, and then the less uh, the, uh, the less dangerous one. Thanks. Stephanie, Dan, um, the, the, Stephanie in the hemp program, just to provide um, a perspective. Sorry, Stephanie, I think. Stephanie, oh, yeah, I apologize. We have um, we need to reserve about seven minutes for public comment. Oh, yeah, sorry, I lost track of the time here. Uh, Let uh, me just mention my idea about uh, manufacturing, and then we can part. Um, I was just thinking that in the hemp program, we base it on who's concentrating something, regardless of the process. Um, it, just because then you can trade and concentrate that exceeds the 60%, but you got to be, I don't know. That was how we put the line, and it wasn't necessarily related to the, um, to the danger associated with it. Uh, so if you are doing it in a crock pot, you're not concentrating it. But um, anyway, just a thought. And uh, the good news is that, again, I think we're going to spend a good chunk of Monday going back over this again and getting into the fees because we didn't get there. So uh, we can pause for now, take public comment, and, and restart again on Monday. You just say your name. Great. How's it going, everyone? This is Ebo from Gaston. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about some of the retail licenses. Um, as someone planning to do a retail store um, in, in Burlington, I, I, I get concerned about like the general store type licenses and the farmer's market stuff just on a compliance, on a compliance level. Um, and I just hope that those will be held to the same standards that you'll hold us to as far as, you know, the distance from a school or a, a daycare, um, general stores. My, my family actually owns one, so it could benefit my family, but you know, there's a lot of kids going in there and, and without having a, a blacked out room, like a, you know, pornography videos or something where for your cannabis, I just, you know, I see it being a compliance nightmare on those, on those type of licenses. And again, just hope that they're held to the same standards as everyone else in retail. Um, and then another thing I want to echo what Chris said about the clones and seeds, um, would love to have those in a dispensary. I think that a lot of people are going to want to come in and buy those. And then, um, on the manufacturing end of things, uh, I just want to give one more shout out to hopefully you guys will see it, um, see fit to do hydrocarbon extracts. And then that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Uh, my name is Ben Mervis. I uh, am formerly a Vermont Department of Health employee, actually, and I went on to work with the FDA. I've been in cannabis for about five years. Um, I'm working with Craig Mitchell, who announced uh, via public comment that we're exploring viable business options here in Vermont uh, as potential social equity applicants. So we're still in that process um, and excited to see where this all goes. Um, most of what we have to say will be submitting to the social equity subcommittee for consideration. 
but we do want to ask the subcommittee to really consider the potential future licenses, in particular delivery and social consumption as they have direct ties to community, um, direct ties to marginalized communities in terms of destigmatization of cannabis and providing safe spaces for consumption. Um, I will also submit some things via online to speak to the reduction in arrests and summonses that New York has seen by providing um, just public consumption uh, language. But of course, we're not looking at public consumption, we're just looking at at least providing people a place to consume. And then also by doing home delivery, you uh, encourage home consumption rather than walking out of a store, walking five feet down the street and consuming there. Um, and that's it for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I, I actually think that's, that's it for public comment in the room. Great. Um, so I, I think, again, Monday's call uh, will be uh, a lot of the same stuff. We'll go through the fees. We'll go through the two proposals. Um, so until then, uh, I will uh, let everyone contemplate over uh, the spreadsheet here. So uh, do I have a motion to, to uh, adjourn for the day? Motion to adjourn. Chris, adjourn, 70 second. Second. Excellent. Uh, and the market structure subcommittee is officially adjourned. <laughs>